Today, we have a very special guest to talk about the future of fraud investigation. We will discuss all aspects of white collar crime, tech, government investigations, and more. Our guest has been listed in the Chambers USA as one of Michigan's leading lawyers in the litigation white collar crime and government investigation field since 2005. As the former head of the tax division at the US Department of Justice, from 2017 to 2021, first as the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and later as the Acting Assistant Attorney General, tax. He's experienced with high profile cases that include subject matter in tax evasion, wire fraud, money laundering, and other schemes. I'd like to introduce Attorney Richard Zuckerman, partner at Hodgman LLP. Hi, Richard, glad to have you on. Good morning, how are you, Michelle? Good morning. Uh, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Uh, you have quite the resume and experience under your belt. Why don't you take a few minutes to tell our audience your story and how you got started as a Michigan graduate, then went off to the Navy and became a prominent attorney. Well, I'll you can leave the prominent out. Um, like you said, I, I went to undergrad at the University of Michigan. Um, I was commissioned the day I graduated as an officer in the Navy. I served four years in the Navy and then decided um, among the choices I had to go to law school. Um, I went to law school in California where the Navy had dropped me off. And then um, after that, I applied for and was hired uh, right out of law school into the organized crime section of the Department of Justice. And so um, I went to DC for training and then uh, was assigned by request to the Detroit Organized Crime Strike Force and prosecuted uh, organized crime cases in Detroit before I entered private practice. And then I practiced, uh, I was engaged in private practice for well over 30 years. And then uh, an opportunity came along to go back to the Department of Justice as head of the tax division and I took it. So that's been kind of, a, that's the thumbnail of, the, uh, of my experience. That's great. And, and thinking back to when you first got started, what is, one of, what is one thing you wish you have known when you began your career? Well, um, I think I would have liked to have known the various things that I ought to have learned before I started to prosecute. Um, the the uh, structure of the Department of Justice way back in the 70s was quite different than, than it is now when it comes to training new lawyers. Um, and I, I thought there were things I could have been better prepared to understand um, when I started to do white collar crime, mafia oriented economic prosecutions. Um, so I have some advice for people who want to get into this field, but there was a lack of, uh, a, you know, a lack of background and I thought too much on the job training. Interesting. And what are the key skills that a white collar defense and government investigator should have? Well, um, you have to want to try cases because ultimately not every case settles and you have to adequately represent a client and, and aggressively represent a client. So you have to be able to try a case. In order to try a case, you can't be, you can't be too shy. You have to have a bit of actor in you. Um, so th that's the first, you have to have a desire and an innate skill, although you can learn to try a case. It's one thing to learn the rudiments of trial. It's another thing to actually feel comfortable and relate to a jury and have a jury relate you, relate to I, you. I bet. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. And then um, on the technical side, if you want to get into uh, white collar crime prosecutions, you should have some accounting, some okay. tax, some understanding of corporate law. And um, now today, uh, a very deep understanding of software and, um, and computers because of the way uh, in which you rely on them now uh, to engage in any form of practice, but certainly when you're doing uh, uh, trial work and investigations and, and labor and document intensive things that require computer backup. That's so true. And for white collar crime cases, like you said, there's always tons of data you have to review and analyze. So what are the challenges of dealing with digital data when it comes to fraud investigation? Well, there's uh, 
really no difference on the defense side and the prosecution side from what I see. Um, sure. the, the first thing in dealing with digital data is you have to be able to get your hands on it. And um, if you're the government, uh, it's, it's relatively easy to get your hands on digital data through the use of grand jury subpoenas, not so easy if the digital data, data is overseas. Mm. The benefit a defense lawyer has is the defense lawyer, if the client's honest with him, um, understands or can be taught by the client where to look a lot quicker than the prosecutor. Oh, but yeah. generally speaking, um, the volume and the mass of that um, just can't be handled in the old way, which is sitting down and going through boxes of documents. You can't really do that anymore. Because if you're really engaged in sophisticated prosecution or sophisticated defense, the amount of data you're going to have to chew through is gigabytes uh, and sometimes terabytes. So you have to you have to not only have the you have to have the hardware and software to analyze it. And then you have to have the skills to to read the printouts and understand what they show. I agree with that. That's right. And name one thing that you would change about the fraud investigation industry if you had all the resources in the world. I'm not sure you, I'm not sure there's much to change. Um, if you're with the government, you certainly would like to be able to get information overseas a lot quicker than you can. And you'd like to have uh, cooperation from foreign governments when you're trying to ferret out transactions American citizens have, have in foreign countries. Um, on the defense side, I suppose uh, you'd like to have more money so that you can actually uh, utilize the, the uh, hardware and software that's available to help you. So it's not so much changing anything, um, it's whether or not you're properly equipped to do the job. Interesting. And you've mentioned that, you know, with white collar crime, the amount of data, the gigabytes, terabytes, do you think there's a way to reduce the time required to conduct a fraud investigation? Well, certainly the better the hardware, the better the software, the quicker to chew through the the data. Right. Um, the government would like the defense to give over everything it has right away. That certainly would um, alleviate some of the uh, uh, enormous amount of time spent on these cases, but you're not going to get that. Of course, it's, it usually doesn't uh, pay the defendant to initially turn everything over. Uh, that's, that's an ongoing process during the course of an investigation. And um, sometimes it behooves the defendant to cooperate, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but uh, you, you really have to be able to, no matter what side of the fence you're on, you have to be able to not only organize the data in some form of a database, but you have to have the skill set to look at documents to understand how they interrelate to each other. Um, because sometimes it'll, you'll see something in an email that says, okay, I'll see you at noon. And that looks very innocuous, but it could be very important because it shows contact. And maybe that's something that that's important in a conspiracy. Yeah. So you just have to be able to churn through this stuff, organize it, and understand. It. Yeah. So many details and following the trail of money and and contacts, like you said. So when you first get a case uh, where there is an ongoing fraud investigation, how do you conduct your fraud investigation? What's your way of doing things, and what's your approach? Well. You first have to have a team um, within the law firm that has a varying degrees of skills so that you can, from the client's point of view, have the least expensive person do the job as long as the person is competent to do it. So the first thing the client wants to see is a team. The next thing the client wants to see is a budget. Um, mm -hmm. and, the next, and the next thing, um, the lawyer wants to do is sit down with the relevant people in the company, find out the structure of the company, understand uh, to the extent it can uh, what it is the government is looking at, what it is the government is going to find, um, and how to respond to the government if the government finds what it's looking for. And for that, you need extensive, ongoing, continuing cooperation from the client to make available the client's uh, documents and the client's personnel. So it, you organize this almost like a military maneuver. You have to get 
you have to have a plan. Uh, you know, you have to have a budget. You, you have to understand where you want to go. You have to understand how to organize the resources, meaning the, the people, uh, the equipment. And then you have to pursue that in a logical, cost-efficient way in order to um, either keep up or be ahead of the government so that at the time when you meet with the government to uh, try to dispose of the case, um, hopefully you know more than the government does and uh, you can come to, uh, you know, come to a, a reasonable solution for the client. Right. Interesting. And in the law enforcement sphere, finding hidden assets and tax fraud are two of the most sought after topics. How do you think technology can play a part to help lawyers prepare for these types of cases? Well, it's basically the same thing. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, it's really how good is the IRS in ferreting out, um, ferreting out this kind of information so the IRS can, can begin an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's nothing better for defense lawyers than to have a well-equipped, aggressive government generating cases for you, although clients don't like to hear that. <laughs> um, the uh, I'm trying to think uh, wh what else would you like to know in this particular area? I mean, we there's well, just the, the IRS, you know, they the IRS can generate cases through they have a fraud detection, unit, correct? And um, the IRS can quickly identify certain simple kinds of tax avoidance schemes. Like for example, in the employment tax area, the IRS can quickly determine if, if a business has, has filed its employment tax returns or not. And if it's filed them, has it paid? And you know, that, those, those are very quick kind of cases to develop. And right now, at least when I was with the government uh, back a couple of years ago, that was the bread and butter of the IRS because you can, generate these kind of cases very quickly. It, it's much more difficult to, to put together a case involving an individual who's have, who has money overseas. Um, I see. And if you have money overseas, a lot of those cases come from whistleblowers, mm. either corporate or individual. Um, but if you have that kind of a case, if the information that, that suggests there's a case is credible and detailed enough, it's a completely different kind of investigation because the government has to be able to obtain foreign bank account records. And that can be, that's a difficult process because every country has different arrangements with the yeah. United States. So, you know, it depends on what you're looking at as to uh, how cases are developed and um, uh, how easy they are to put together. Right. I mean, you have to get the documents first. And once you get it, like you said, there's just so much data, have to go through the details, make those connections and uh, follow the flow of uh, funds. And you mentioned um, international uh, banks and uh, paperwork and getting information. So let's take a minute to talk about Pandora Papers. OK. The Pandora Papers is tied to alleged money laundering cases um, done by key political and social figures. What role do you think accountants and investigators ha uh, could have to limit uh, future occurrences? Well, there's a difference between the accountants and the investigators, and the difference between accountants, lawyers, and investigators when it comes to this, this issue. The, the government believes and and talks about this, that accountants and lawyers are gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. They are people that are supposed to keep clients honest. And their role, if they are ethical and, and are following the rules of their re uh, respective professions, they are the ones that um, are supposed to make certain that clients do not engage in this kind of activity or that they mm -hmm. do not assist the clients in facilitating this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's their primary role. But there's a big difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. Correct. And so there are very complicated tax arrangements which are legitimate. Mm -hmm. And then there are very complicated tax arrangements which are illegitimate. And it's up to the lawyers and the accountants to make certain that what a client is engaging in is legitimate avoidance, not illegal evasion. Um, investigators, they have to have... A, the resources and patience. And the, the problem with sometimes the institutions of government is 
um, they'd rather see a thousand little cases mm. than 10 huge cases because huge cases take a long, long time. And mm. if, you're, if you're measuring performance by statistical achievement, um, okay. a thousand little cases look a lot better than that they come to conclusion or they look a lot better than uh, 10 major cases that take years to develop. Um, but the agents have to have patience. They have to have smarts. They themselves have to understand not only um, the, the, the tools they have, but they have to understand the law because you don't want an agent to spend time chasing a group of facts that even if they are developed, don't result in a violation. So agents have to be almost as equally skilled in the law as the lawyers are. They have to understand the basic elements of what, what crimes they're looking at. They have to know how to focus in on the evidence uh, that are, that's necessary to prove a case. And then they have to have the patience to try to develop it. Some foreign investigations, uh, you'll send out what's called an MLAT, which is a request for documents. It might take two years to get the documents. Oh. So, you know, patience is a key word. And smarts. Patience and smarts. Got it. Patience and smarts. <laughs> Got it. And so we've talked about white collar crime with traditional banking systems where you follow the money via wire, check, deposit slips. But another topic that I see pop up in cases um, more often is cryptocurrency. So can cryptocurrency's rapid growth be compared to a Ponzi scheme? Well, not a Ponzi scheme. I, I'm kind of suspicious about cryptocurrency, um, leaving aside the fact that it's a pretty good device to hide your wealth mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. But what good is it if it's not accepted in the marketplace? So sure. I look at it, and the rough analogy is if you and I collect baseball cards, uh, to us, they're very valuable. And, and to the collector's world, they're very bad. But let's say you have a, a Honus Wagner, which is, I think, the rarest baseball card there is. <laughs> you can't go into a Cadillac dealer and trade it for a car. So, no. the, so the question is, um, how and where can it be legitimately utilized? Mm -hmm. Certainly among traders, um, you know, they buy and sell among themselves, just like baseball card people buy and sell among themselves. But Ultimately, uh, unless you're just hiding money, um, I'm not quite sure what you do with it. Now, maybe in five years, this comment will look like I'm some form of an intellectual Neanderthal when I didn't really understand the promise of cryptocurrency <laughs> when it comes to it being a, a recognized worldwide currency. But right now, uh, that would be my concern. On the other hand, um, if you... It's still, if you're using it to hide things, okay, you hide them, but you still ultimately want to use them for something. And that's really the question. Where can you use them? That's interesting. Yeah, so you're right. So it's We're... not quite a Ponzi scheme because gotcha. it's real. It's real among the people who are dealing in it. There's and value. You can, you can retrieve them uh, as long as you don't lose your, your code or your key. But uh, what are you going to do with them? That's a good question. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's so for... it's it, and it, it's not. I think I read this morning in anticipation of the call that one of the one of the currencies selling for sixty one thousand a piece now, um, and they have wide fluctuations. Yes. Yeah. So, I think it's buyer beware. Interesting. And from your experience, what has been the biggest challenge in dealing with federal? and state white collar crime cases throughout your career? Well, from a defense point of view, it's um, having a client that has and is willing to spend the money to provide an adequate defense. And I think when you talk about white collar crime cases, you know, you can have one individual engaged in white collar criminal activity, or you can have a multinational corporation engaged in white collar criminal activity. And between the one person and the multi-billion dollar company. There's a variety of different um, challenges for a lawyer representing those people. Um, the, the individual generally cannot afford an, an aggressive defense. 
And so the question is how to best resolve it quickly so that the representation doesn't bankrupt the individual. And on the other hand, clients today are, are very, larger clients are very sophisticated. They, mm -hmm. they demand that lawyers prepare a budget. They demand to know who's working on the case. They negotiate fees. Um, but they still want the same result as if, uh, as if they'd written a blank check. So the, I think the major, uh, you know, besides getting the work, uh, dealing with the client and making certain that the client is happy with the representation and get the results it wants um, is a, it's a function of being, uh, you know, an intelligent, thorough, aggressive lawyer constrained by the economics of, that the client's willing to put into the matter. Got it. And for our audience out here, what advice would you give to other professionals just entering this domain? Well, like I said, if you want to, if you want to be a, um, a defense lawyer or a prosecutor, you should have some tax back. Uh, you should have some accounting back. You should familiarize yourself with the various software packages that are out there that assist in this, in this endeavor. Um, you should want to be able, you should want to be a trial lawyer and you should hopefully develop the skills to be a trial lawyer because not all cases settle. Um, mm. uh, and you have to be, the client's hiring you from start to finish. I don't think many clients want to hear that they spent millions of dollars with you, but the client wants to go to trial, but you're, you're either unable or unwilling to try a case. So um, you, you have to want to have that skill set, and then you have to take the time and effort to develop it. Um, and sometimes it takes a while to develop a client, so you, you keep up, as they say. You, you read the literature, you follow what the Department of Justice is saying about what they're going to focus in on, you follow what the IRS is saying, you see what Congress is trying to push the government to do for whatever political reason the Congress wants. And, um, you, you know, you go to CLE and you, you take certain courses so that you're as prepared as possible when someone walks in the door. That's, that's great advice. Well, Richard, you brought up a lot of great points and a lot of interesting topics to kind of think about. I want to thank you again for joining us today um, on this podcast. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, you're quite welcome. Bye.